Hi, I'm Dave Stewart and you're watching Noise 11. Welcome to Noise11.com. It's great to have Dave Stewart back in the country. It's been a while since you've been down under, Dave. Yeah, it was uh, 10, about 10 years, maybe 11 years. Was that the Peace Tour? Yeah, uh, was that 2009? Uh, or 1999. Oh yeah, 1999, yeah. Fair. Was it? Yeah. Jesus. Time flies when you're having fun, huh? Y yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Well, that was, that was actually quite a successful reunion. Have you talked to Annie about it wasn't doing really another a, one? It wasn't a reunion. It was, we decided to do a tour for Amnesty and Greenpeace. Mm -hmm. And we gave all the proceeds to Amnesty and Greenpeace from our ticket sales, our merchandise, and our DVD and everything, which is quite unusual, really. And... Uh, they could then enlist people at our concerts and all that kind of stuff. So it was it was really quite sort of a meaningful, you know, moment to release an album called Peace and then do a whole year of uh, working with Greenpeace and Amnesty. And it was really brilliant for all concerned, I think. What would uh, it take to get you and Annie back together again? Um, well... Well, we, it would take just Annie and I deciding we wanted to do something together, you know. See, uh, there's so many um, bands that have stayed together all the way through their career and are still playing live right now, you know. Um, and when you're a duo, and we were so intense, like, you know, because we made 10 albums in 10 years or something, toured constantly, but before that we'd lived together for four or five years as a couple. Didn't write any songs as a couple, broke up and wrote like 150 songs about it. Then toured for, um, you know, that amount of time. Then we decided to have a break because life, you know, children, marriages, all sorts of stuff. And then after about that, I think it was about a nine year break, we did the peace tour. So judging on our past history, it's probably like every 10 years, isn't it? <laughs> so we're about due now then. <laughs> uh, well, it's a bit, I'm a bit busy at the moment. Uh, but Annie and I talk all the time. You know, when I'm in London, we go out to dinner together. We never talk about... People think, you know, if you're in a band or you're in a duo, that you just constantly talk about that. But, you know, uh, like, for instance, I work all the time with uh, Mick, you know, Mick Jagger, who's in Super Heavy and... You, you're going to be sitting talking all the time about the Rolling Stones. Mm. You know what I mean? It's Annie and I don't talk about your Rolling Stones. We never even mention it, you know. We talk about our children and what's happening in our lives and all that stuff. And um, I think that's the best way to be, really. Mm. Well, that work with Mick and Super Heavy, uh, which we, we can talk a, b a bit about, uh, you go back to about 1987, the Primitive Cool album. Was that when you first started working with Mick Jagger? Uh, a bit before that, actually. We, um, well, you see, the thing is, again, with uh, musicians and, uh, well, artists in general, you see, people hear things come out and they think, oh, that's when they actually started. But Mick and I have written like tons and tons of songs for fun that are for no reason, so you don't hear them. Mm. Just we hear them. So then you'd hear a blip of something that does come out. But before that, we did uh, actually a sort of soundtrack song for a film called Ruthless People and uh, but we've done lots of stuff over the years you know. Mm. And Super Heavy the most recent collaboration with Mick and a, a fascinating mix of different flavours mm. musical styles personalities in that band. Yeah uh, well yeah it was on purpose was to make a kind of uh, you know a montage of, of culture cultures and music culture and do it. it's like a huge experimental thing where we wanted to make music that sounded sort of tough and sort of bluesy, but with Jamaican rhythms and Asian sort of influences, as opposed to what a lot of people describe as world music, which sounds a little bit more sort of like chill music. We don't want to make chill music, we want to make some kind of tough sounding music. Mm. Uh, reviewers had a hard time um, fathoming what that album In was Australia, all about. In Australia, yeah, I noticed that. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Not really, yeah. Uh, <coughs> well, what, what, you know, let's, let's talk about this. So, certain 
reviewers did. Um, see, when you do something like that, there's usually two reactions. Is one is they don't listen to it. You just think, oh, that's a preposterous idea. There's the English journalism that'll go, Mick's got a pink suit on. Mm. And then there's people who are really into music, like, uh, you know, Rolling Stone or, you know, French, uh, their kind of rock and folk, which is their big music magazine. And all these people, they didn't have trouble at all. They just gave us great reviews. And, and, uh, and actually, in places like France, Italy, Germany, Japan, everywhere it was, you know, straight in top five and uh, in the charts and um, then it's up to the people and now you see people once they've consumed it they start to listen to it by word of mouth that it's passing all over the the world hey you should check out this album by <laughs> Super Heavy yeah but you know what is that is that rain that's the rain yes it's is it really just got our cool chains through goodbye 33 degrees oh right does that happen like it, it gets boiling hot and then does that well, it, it does ever since global kind of warming tropical. came into existence. Yeah. <laughs> right. So, um, yeah, but actually, you know, what was really weird for us was Australia was the worst country in the world for us for super heavy. I don't know why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you, it, you wouldn't think it because it's very sort of culturally mixed here. I guess it's an album you have to listen to a few times. You can't just listen to it the once, isn't it? Because those flavours just pop. Mm, I don't know. With familiarity. Ah, uh, yeah, I suppose so. Mm. Mm. Well, not only that album this year, you have been very busy in the recording well, studio. I have let's released six, seven albums this year or something like that. Wow. Well, let's talk about Blackbird Diaries, yeah. which is a fascinating mm-hmm. record. Like, is, is, is this the Dave Stewart record of the year, though? Um, well, it, it was really funny because it came out in a roundabout way. You know, it's one of these things where I, um, you know, I was just in London, stuck in a sort of, you know, a volcanic ash cloud blocked all the flights it's quite a famous sort of thing that happened about a year and a half ago and I'll give you $50 if you can pronounce the name of the volcano oh no <laughs> it's got like remember it's got 26 letters yeah, in it, it was, it? yeah but um, so I bought a guitar and it happened to be a guitar owned by a country and western singer called Red River Dave a very eccentric guy in 25 30 years ago and I started playing it and I was just messing about playing country blues and then the phone rang and somebody said will you go and meet Martina McBride in Nashville and John McBride I thought that's pretty weird I've just got this guitar that, you know owned by a legendary country singer now I'm flying to meet a legendary country singer and I got to Nashville and in this studio called the Blackbird Studios I just fell in love with it and I said I'm coming back here to make a record and I think they thought I was joking or they thought maybe it's in six months and I was like back like in a few days mm-hmm. going here I am Let's go. And the, and the whole album took like five days to record? Yeah, made the whole album in five days. That was writing and recording the song. Being Dave Stewart, I guess, and having a, uh, a very good uh, Teledex phone book, um, you know, the, uh, the guests that appear on, on, on this record from uh, Stevie Nicks, uh, Bob Dylan, Secret mm. Sisters. Mm-hmm. Is this Dave Stewart just making a few phone calls and getting well, the mates in? No, nah, I'd already been making Stevie Nicks' album and co-writing that, so obviously... In the middle of recording Stevie Nicks' album is when I went to make my album, so we talked all the time. Uh, Bob Dylan I've been friends with and sort of done all sorts of things with since about 1984. You know, making videos, shooting little films. The Wilburys that kind of formed in my house and recorded in my house. Mm. Um, and the Secret Sisters, um, they were uh, friends of John McBride who'd helped record their album and um, they were in the studio when I went in the studio in Nashville people were so curious uh, people would come by like uh, Lady Antebellum or the Secret Sisters or whatever to see what was going on and um, and it you know just turned into a, this five day kind of odyssey you know mm. and uh, Colby Calais I wrote a song with her and that is on the album too but there's like three duets I think and about ten songs just straightforward storytelling of mine I think it was you who described it as Dylan meets Cohen meets Petty meets Reed meets Cash uh, I didn't say that but whoever did someone I'm going to send did. them a, what do you think of the uh, vodka martini what, what do you think of that then well, sound wise I suppose it's got it wanders through all of those 
things and it's very sort of storytelling lyrically about my own personal life so probably it's those elements that give it that sort of feeling yeah and there are sounds on there that sort of date back to the eurythmics days i mean you know you might uh, uh, hear a little bit of what could have been a sweet dreams type sound did you go and listen back to old records or no there's is not. that just something inbuilt into your dna um no there's nothing electronic or eurythmic see in that way but m- melodically obviously because mm. that's part of my dna as you say uh, but it was all, you know, played live in a room like this. And I would sing live with the band playing pedal, steel, drums, bass, guitar, piano. And um, very traditional in a way. Yeah. And putting b- together the companion movie for the record as well. Yeah. Um, we're busy editing the movie. And um, since then, I went back to Nashville and made Joss Stone's new album. And then I went back and made another album for myself called The Ringmaster General. And then I went there and made the first half of Orianti's new album, which we're finishing next year. And uh, so I've been back and forth to Nashville about 10 times this year. Mm. You've done some amazing things with technology uh, over the years too. When, when, when did you start to get into technology and basically become a bit of a, an entrepreneur? Um, well, when I realized, uh, you know, when Apple brought out its first computers and I realized... <coughs> well, even before that, when the first drum computer came out, or the first sort of real sequencer that you could create stuff like Sweet Dreams, I realized it was going to be a huge influence on music, and I wanted to understand it and used it, use it when it was, you know, interesting in the sound. But I never got sort of completely married to it so that it dominated my life. Uh, but, you know, when the internet sort of really broke open... I think about 12 years ago I did a speech to you know Quincy Jones and Dr. Dre and Stevie Wonder and all these huge amount of people around a table in a bank and explained it was the end of the world as we know it and it's in a, that's all in a book I wrote called The Business Playground which came out last year yeah there was uh, The Hospital The Hospital is a place that um, I wanted to create a place where different creatives could meet and it was based on actually Marla's wife in Vienna we used to have host these dinners and invite like an architect, a painter, a musician, you know. And Vien- the face of Vienna kind of changed. And so from that little I- seed of an idea, uh, Paul Allen got very interested in it. And then we went, I showed him this hospital that was in Covent Garden that had been empty for 10 years. And it's now a very sort of thriving creative community there it's where Radiohead made in rainbows their album and filmed it and loads of things happen there and one of the things you're working on at the moment is goes to the musical we will be seeing the premiere of that coming up in Melbourne Australia yeah well we uh, opened in England in March and it's been a huge success it's in the West End and it's going to be in the West End and then it's also going to be on in Broadway in March 2012 but yesterday, uh, myself and the Minister of Tourism announced that Melbourne is going to have Costa Musical opening in 2013. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's been um, amazingly well received, and uh, hopefully it will be in Australia too. Have you written new music for this? Oh yeah, it's all new music. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's all, you know, completely, well, a musical, so, you know, 16 new songs or whatever. So we will be seeing Dave Stewart at least back in Australia for 2013, because Absolutely. obviously you'll be down for the premiere. Well, I'll be back before that, so I'm going to play live here again, and I'm probably going to come back with Josh Stone and play live and, you know, have fun, basically. Mm. Well, it's a fascinating story. It's uh, great to catch up and, uh, you know, hear just a slight fraction of the life of Dave Stewart. Uh, thank you for joining us here at Noise 11. All right. Cheers.